Hi, I'm Mark Cameron, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Mark Cameron. You can find all of the archives of the show over at HankGarner.com. And when you're there, please click on the links in the right-hand sidebar to subscribe to the show. That way you don't miss an episode. Thank you to all of our sponsors. We're going to be telling you about them throughout the show uh, for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, go to HankGarner.com and click on the link to advertise. It's up in the top menu bar. There's a brand new collection I'd like to tell you about. It's called Chronicles of Mirstone. 200 years ago, the dwarven clans and the elvish houses of Mirstone were at peace. The king of the dwarves, in a selfish and greedy mood, used his wizards to expand their mountain empire, raising new peaks from the forest floors of their elven neighbors. War and hatred ensued. The Chronicles of Mirstone offers a glimpse into the lives of the elves and dwarves living in the aftermath as they seek for a new peace. Six talented authors lend their voices to a tale of destruction, mistrust, and hope. The Chronicles of Mirstone available now at Amazon.com. There's a link in the show notes. There's another great book I'd like to tell you about. It's called Joseph of Bethlehem. You think you know the story of Joseph uh, in the Christmas story? But you know, there's always a part of the story that you don't know. Uh, We've been talking about Two Months with Harvey, the new book by Terry R. Hill. And I do want you to go pick up that book because proceeds from that are going to benefit people still struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. But it's also Christmas time. And this book that Terry has meticulously researched brings to light a character that is so often overlooked, yet brings out one of the most human aspects of the Christmas story. Go pick up a copy of Joseph of Bethlehem today. Uh, I personally endorse it. It's a fantastic book. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm really excited to bring you a show with Mark Cameron. Mark is the author of the brand new Tom Clancy book, Power and Empire. Uh, Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, thanks, Hank. Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Well, my, um, my aunt was um, a librarian. My parents are teachers, and a lot of my relatives are teachers, so we were surrounded by books. And my aunt used to give me and my sister boxes of discarded books when, you know, the whole time we were from my earliest memory from the library. And um, I remember reading and thinking as a small child that I would really, I'd like to do this and sort of copying book, you know, copying words out of books was, as I learned to write. And it's fun because I see my own grandsons doing that now. But I, my first particular memory would be my aunt gave me a signed copy of, of uh, Wilton, Wilson Rawls' Where the Red Fern Grows and that she had gotten at a library convention and I was um nine and well I guess I was in the middle of the third grade so I was eight and uh just really starting to read chapter books so I was really trying to work my way through that book and um my mom read it to me and then uh, I I really loved it because it made me cry (laughs) and uh, (laughs) took it into my teacher and she read it to me I read it to the class and um I just remember thinking even back then that's probably my earliest memory that I I really want to write stories like this. I want to write stories that make people laugh and cry. Love it. Um, but, but you did not go on to have a, uh, traditional, uh, writers, uh, training and, uh, and career, uh, right out of school. Did you? No, no. I, I, I mean, I, I wrote all through junior high and high school and, you know, before, anybody even conceived of something like fan fiction or anything like that. I wrote James Bond stories and stuff in high school and, um, 
Uh, in fact, I, I just did a book signing in Fort Worth, and one of the girls I knew from high school came up and she said, I want you to sign this the way you you introduced yourself to me the first time as Bond, James Bond. <laughs> so, I, you know, I knew I liked that that genre, and so I wrote a lot of those sorts of things, but just for fun. And um, I I had a teacher tell me, a really hard teacher in high school, she wrote on one of my papers that said, uh, she gave me a C because it was, you know, messy and handwritten probably with pencil and turned in a day late probably knowing me and um but at the top of that messy paper that got a c she wrote in pencil mark this looks publishable to me and that those little words really sort of made me realize i should maybe i could do this if this hard teacher if miss skidmore who was the hardest teacher i probably ever had thinks this is publishable, and, and of course it wasn't. I never got that published, but those encouraging words really sort of set me on a new direction. So I knew I knew I wanted to be a police officer. I, I always wanted to, you know, want to be in law enforcement. And, um, so I told my wife I wanted to be a policeman and a novelist, and she bought me our first year of marriage. She bought me a bulletproof vest and a Smith Corona typewriter to support my dreams, and so... I went on to work in law enforcement and eventually wrote as well. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, I, I had no idea that you were pursuing uh, writing uh, that early as well. Um, and I, I love hearing these stories of people along the path uh, that are encouragers. And, uh, you know, because the writers deal with a lot of rejection, uh, but, you know, it only mm-hmm. takes a, a kind word placed here and there. And, and you know, as, as writers, we hold on to those things like like nuggets of gold. And uh, oh, I, I, yeah. I love I love hearing that. Um, so what was the what was the first story that that you wrote uh, that you did get published? You know, I wrote. uh my goodness, I don't even remember. I wrote several short stories. Um, I think I got something in a college paper. I wrote several um, local stories. Um, I wrote westerns in the beginning. I wrote uh, I wrote under the pen name Mark Henry and uh, wrote I ghost wrote for another author. So one where I didn't have my name on the cover that you know by contract can't talk about. But you see his books on the on the uh, shelves, a ghost wrote those. Sort of a the tryout process from the um, from the uh, publisher, and then they eventually published a couple of my Mark Henry westerns. And then um, there's another author named Mark Henry who and I, I was using a synonym because I'm in you know was in law enforcement at the time. Or I had to get approval to write you know uh, while I was working and could only work during the off times and. Fortunately, I had a I had another a, a college professor who gave me some really good advice, and he said, you know, unless you unless you use those 15 minute segments of your life that everybody else is wasting, you're not going to amount to much. And I uh, he he knew me. He knew I would waste a lot of time. And in fact, he was a, a theater professor, and uh, so he saw me during rehearsals and such. But uh, I I really tried to use the time as a you know when I was waiting for airplanes at work or um you know the off time and uh put together stories and so i i wrote some westerns and then because of what i did for a living um was able to sort of turn the corner and and do and work into the thriller genre i love it and 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 you have uh a number of excellent uh thrillers that you published uh in the jericho quinn series where did where did jericho quinn come from you know, I think he's sort of an amalgamation of uh, our our oldest son is a was an Air Force Academy or he is an Air Force Academy graduate, um, very very focused young man. He he um, he was in the academy when I started writing the books and and uh, actually in grad school I think, and but had his sights on OSI and um, the Office of Special Investigations with the Air Force and so I wanted a different kind of character. Then you know, I mean, not to detract from SEALs and Special Forces and all that, but I just wanted to write a different character. And so I I created this um, OSI, Special Agent with OSI, that's an Air Force Academy grad. Our, our oldest son did uh, some, um, 
he was an exchange student, or not an exchange student, but a foreign student in uh, Nanjing, China. So he speaks he speaks Mandarin. Um, I speak some Japanese, and so I and I have friend, you know, I'm growing up in Texas, and I speak law enforcement Spanish, not certainly not fluent, but so I I gave this character a bunch of, you know, I made him um, multilingual and sort of an ambiguous uh, ethnicity from, from his looks, so he can fit in all over the world, and uh, created uh, and and I ride motorcycles, and I've been involved in martial arts, and I have friends that are certainly much better than me and much more tactical than I am, and so I just sort of picked the best of everybody that I knew and put him into this character, and um, it uh, it seems to be readers seem to like him, and and they like his big Cajun Cajun sidekick as well, so. <laughs> Well, I, as someone who's from South Mississippi, uh, I can uh, mm-hmm. I can fully appreciate the Cajun sidekick. That's uh, it sounds like there you go. yeah, there you it go. sounds like anybody at my family reunion when I when I read. Oh, there you those. go. <laughs> oh man, um, what do you think? Um, having him uh, as an OSI agent, uh, uh, what do you think that allowed you to do? Uh, that maybe is different in the genre. That uh, you know, having a I don't want to say a typical seal, but you know what I mean. That that those those characters sure. tend to pop up a lot in the genre. But but moving him out of that, what do you think that allows you to do as a writer? Well, I I came up in the U.S. Marshals, which is a um, not a really well known agency. I mean, when people think about U.S. Marshals, they think about the old West generally. And so when I when I when someone finds out I'm with the U.S. Marshals, I generally end up having to, to teach them a little bit about what uh, marshals do, and it's the same with OSI. OSI is not it's it's uh, it's like the NCIS except it's Air Force, and so that's an easy way to let people know what they generally do because NCIS is on you know has TV series and all of that, and, but uh, because they're not as well known. It's a great um, opportunity for a writer to teach, and you know that's what we're doing. We're we're um, giving new information. We're taking information that we've learned here and there and putting it together and weaving it into stories. And these books are certainly the Clancy books are much more. I don't want to say the Jericho books are not realistic. I try to be uh, plausible, and but not with the Jericho Quinn books. They're not probable with the. With the Clancy books, they're a lot more probable. So, think of one as a, a more of a swashbuckling Indiana Jones, and the other, you know, the Clancy books are, are completely different in that regard, but uh, both possible. Yeah. Um, speaking of Clancy, were you a were you a Clancy fan uh, back in in the the heyday of of Clancy publishing? I was indeed. I was a. I first picked up um, the Hunt for Red October. Not long after um, President Reagan said it was his favorite book, I was a rookie, you know, a pretty new police officer back in, I hired on in 1984, so and I think the book came out in 84, so I was uh, really new and looking for diversions from the, the stress of training and all of that, so I uh, I read early on, I became a Clancy fan and was immediately hooked, and I pretty much remember where I was when I read most of the Clancy books, um, I, right after the when uh, Ramsey Youssef and his crew tried to blow up the World Trade Center the first time, I was uh, I, I got sent to New York to help on the protective detail for one of the judges, and uh, I remember picking up without remorse on the way there and reading that book while I was there and just being that that kept me gave me a diversion from what we were doing during the day and, and uh, the kind of high op tempo of the, the protective op to um, being able to read such a good book. That's one of my all-time favorites. And, and people that read Power and Empire will see that, I think. At least I hope they do. We'll see the, the connection with Without Remorse and John Clark. What what's crazy is uh, is uh, I too uh, was a huge Clancy fan and uh, and yes you, you begin reading them for diversion uh, but by the end of the book you're just scared you know um, <laughs> it scares the crap out of you because you know because there is that that more than plausibility you know it's uh yeah. it's it's really crazy and uh, you know he he really um, uh, 
especially with that first book, I mean, just, he created a genre, you know, that, that, that was not, uh, either wasn't being served or didn't exist yet. Uh, it's crazy. Um, but, uh, he you know, absolutely you know, did. He's a master. Absolutely. And, uh, and we know that, uh, that, uh, Mr. Clancy, uh, passed away, uh, untimely death in 2013. Um, but there, there have been subsequent novels in his, in his universe and with his character since then. Um, I think there's been what, six or seven, uh, since then, uh, seven. Well, I, I know, I, yeah, I know of, um, I can't think of one of them. Peter Tellip, maybe I, I was one, but I don't, I'm not sure I may be getting the name wrong, but then Mark Graney wrote the last seven. I uh, wrote seven, seven of the, I shouldn't say the last seven, but uh, wrote seven of the Jack Ryan, you know, the, the bigger um, sort of world geopolitical books, like when you think of a Clancy. And then um, Grant Blackwood wrote several uh, sort of focusing on the Jack Ryan Jr. campus side of things. And then Mike Madden would be the newest one. He wrote uh, one of the campus books, the summer Jack Ryan Jr. books, right before I did. And then Mark Graney um, is a friend of mine and um, sort of unbeknownst to me, he, he he was reading one of my books for a, a cover blurb, you know, to give me an author blurb. And we've been friends for a couple of years. And unbeknownst to me, he had passed it on to the editors at Putnam when he had decided, you know, Mark decided to, to uh, sort of step back from the Clancy's after doing seven. That's a lot of of big books like that while you're working on your own projects and he decided to focus on his own projects and um he recommended me so i'm I'm very grateful for that this has been a um quite an opportunity I, i'll bet um as a as a clancy fan i can only imagine you know what that phone call uh was like were, were you were you taken aback and uh you know what, what were those initial emotions when you think about taking over such uh, an iconic franchise. Well, uh, I think the word "awesome" is probably used too much nowadays. But the "awesome" it, it really was a, a sort of drive you to your knees kind of a conversation. I, I was in Florida with my wife and uh, researching for another um, book, another Jericho Quinn book, and my agent called me to tell me basically the story I just told you that you know I'd been recommended, and um, so I. My wife thought we were we were on the beach, sort of taking a little break. And from the look on my face, I think my wife thought someone had died because she took a picture of me with the phone to my ear, and I looked really kind of sad. And um, and then the next picture is of me laying on the beach, sort of pass out looking. But but I uh, it, it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. But the weight of trying to carry on with these iconic characters that Clancy created and then these other authors have done such a great job, just a fantastic job carrying on is a, is a, is a bit daunting. But, you know, it's after you get past that initial um, sort of, they want me to do what? There's no way. Then, then and you, especially working with Tom Colgan, the editor at Putnam and the, the great folks at Putnam, and then, um, you know, communicating with Mike to make sure our stories at least had the same, you know, names and such as that, and so they didn't conflict. And then working with Mark Graney to make sure the the continuity carried on, and that's just been a fantastic uh, journey and opportunity. I I would uh, not trade it. I can imagine not. Um, we we talked about the uncanny, which is also probably an overused word, uh, but uncanny mm. ability that that, uh, that Mr. Clancy had for kind of seeing into the future and, and figuring out what what might happen uh, and and then building a, a scenario that that you know feels like you're reading it uh, out of the headlines um, how do you as an author stepping into that how do you pick up that mantle and and start looking into the future you know, I think authors and and police officers often entertain ourselves and train ourselves by playing what if games so Many times on midnight patrols as a patrol officer or sitting with a uh, a bad guy in court, you know, guarding someone while a, a hearing's going on or a trial's going on, you play what-if games. What if 
this character did that, what would I do? So, um, or if you know you're driving by the little local stop and rob, whatever store, and you know what if I would drive by and see, you know Felicia, my friend who's the clerk there getting robbed. What do how do I approach? And so as an author, you're doing exactly that. So taking these wonderful rich characters um, and putting them into real world events and then letting them sort of run. So. And and I do a lot of reading. I read, um, and I and I try to to either go to primary sources or or read on. I hate to get political, but both sides of the aisle, if you will, not not listen to, not just listen to one, um, just one side of things, and make my own conclusions. And uh, read. I I'm a voracious reader of The Economist and Foreign Policy and, you know, books like that with a lot of uh, critical thought. And so it allows me to to just say, at least knowing a little bit of what I know from, because I was not in the intelligence community, but I know many people that were and are. And so it allows me to, from knowing their personalities and knowing how things are done, it allows me to sort of prime the pump and see where it goes. For instance, I, this book, people may pick it up a few months from now. There's a little scene in there where, um, in Power and Empire, where uh, some American soldiers are killed in Africa, and President Ryan has to make a call back to the family. So people might think that that's something that I saw that happened recently, and, and this book was handed in months before that. But in my research, seeing that we have military advisors and people in Africa, it's not a great big leap to think that with the threat of threats that, that our military men and women face today, that something like that is going to happen. Absolutely. Um, speaking of you know, intelligence, uh, the intelligence community, and, and you did not come up that way. Um, in doing research, uh, are you ever? Do you ever come up against brick walls where you're trying to chase down something that you think might? be plausible or things that might exist and and uh, in your research uh, you get turned away uh, because uh, novelists don't need to know those things? You know, fortunately, I have not had that specific um, experience because I turned so many people away as a chief deputy. <laughs> <laughs> they would ask questions about, you know, the witness protection program or whatnot. So I kind of know intuitively what's going to turn off a, an official and they're not going to want to talk to me. And, and frankly, I don't want to be the, the uh, I don't want somebody to open up any book that I write and have it be a guideline for the bad guys. And so the, the thing that I do that, that has become apparent to me over the years is much of the information, not all, certainly not all, but much of the information we have that's top secret is, is classified because of where we got it, not because of, not specifically because of what it is, and so it's it's putting together those open source things, you know, open source bits of information that makes them critical and how we put them together. So as a writer, I I know where to look, and so I can go and and glean through these open source things, and and I think that's what Tom Clancy knew intuitively. He, you know, he he didn't come up through that community, but he knew. Okay, well, I look at this, and I look at that, and I look at, you know, this aerospace magazine and this naval magazine, and I can see. All right, yeah, I put this truth and this truth and this truth together. Then A, B, and C must, you know, D must follow, and that's what I do. So I I chat with. I, when I talk to folks in the intelligence community. In my old my old job in the bureau in the Texas Highway Patrol, you know, I get information, but really I'm looking for vernacular. I'm looking for the behind the scenes stuff. And when I talk to the Coast Guard folks for the to research the first part of this book, I want to know what they were thinking when they took off. I want to know about the you know the goose crap on the field. I want to know because I can look up on line how to you know what levers to pull and buttons to push on a helicopter, but I want to know about the people. And so I really focus more on that with, rather than um, the ins and outs of the intelligence uh, gathering side of things, because I understand that. And, and speaking of the, the human side of stories, um, 
you know that that was one thing that that uh, that Mr. Clancy did well was that not only moved the the giant geopolitical chess pieces, but then he would come down to the to the the person level, the human level, and uh, uh, you know, like a, in in the Bear and the Dragon, for instance, you know, there was this. Uh, uh, you know, he, he had a couple of Chinese characters who were going through, uh, you know, the, the fallout of the, the one child policy, you know, that he, he brings mm-hmm. this very, very close personal story, you know, out of it. And, and one of the, the sub threads in this book of yours deals with, uh, the crimes against children and the, uh, uh the, uh, you know, human trafficking. Was that something that was important to you? And uh, was that something you've been thinking about for a while? Uh, like, what, what was the thought process of bringing that subplot to this book? That's a good question. I, the the marshal service. I, I can't remember what year. It was well before I retired. But the marshal service was assigned um, enforcement of portions of the Adam Walsh Act, which is the basically a, that act makes not registering as a sex offender of federal crime under certain circumstances. And so it, because the Marshal Service is a um, the, really, maybe I'm prejudiced here, but it's the preeminent fugitive hunting um, group in the world, um, we got to assign that to, to look for these folks. And so, you know, during the last five years of my career, that, that became... Um, Really forefront in, in what I uh, I didn't I supervised folks that did it but uh, we were out among folks looking for people and, and those sorts of investigations and so that that was a topic of conversation and of course as a writer I'm always taking notes and thinking of what ifs like I said and I was after I retired I was just chatting with a friend of mine um, who's the Mike Michael Bork uh, who Burke who's the um, chief psychologist with the Marshal Service and uh, about this and I wasn't even I hadn't even conceived the uh, I didn't even know I was going to write a, a Tom Clancy novel and he was telling me about a program in Texas called IPC or the Intervention for the Protection of Children and he referred me to uh, and, and shortly after that in fact I talked to him on the way down to Florida and then shortly after that, I found out about the Clancy thing and the uh, job, and I thought, man, this will, this fits perfectly into the kind of plot that I'd like to do. And so Mike Burke introduced me to uh, Texas Department of Public Safety uh, lieutenant at the time. He's a captain now, Derek Prestridge, who really pioneered this program, and it was such a fascinating and, and worthwhile program to train officers how to recognize uh, kids and people that are being trafficked during traffic stops and, and violator contacts. And, uh, you know, the, they went from, from basically zero to several dozen the first year of, of children saved. And um, such an awesome program that it, it just it fit very well into what I wanted and the kind of sort of larger-than-life program, just like the larger-than-life characters. So it, it fit very nicely into the book. Well, it's larger than life, uh, yet is, is there's stuff going on right under our noses. Uh, you know, uh, we, we live in a, or near a town with a uh, major interstate going through, and uh, it, it's crazy the things that are going on that we just don't know about. And hopefully a book like this that has a, a big, big story but, uh, you know, brings down some very human things, maybe that will open some people's eyes and uh, – and, and and we can we can make a difference with that. So uh, kudos well, for well, including I hope so. that. I, I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I hope so because it's frankly, even though it, it gets down in the nitty gritty about these uh, these children and and people that are being trafficked, it uh, I have to say I, I toned it back from how bad it could have been. I, I can I can only imagine I can only imagine. Um, uh, Mark, the the book is called Power and Empire. It's the brand new Tom Clancy book. Um, I have been reading it. It is phenomenal. Um, I'm I'm recommending everybody go pick it up. Um, as someone who has had uh, such a storied uh, writing career as you've had, uh, if there's some writers in the audience out there who maybe are are struggling at the beginning of their writing career, um, is there a piece of advice that you would give them? Well, you know that that fifteen minute advice that my my professor gave me use those i had a a one of my deputy marshal cohort was after I started getting published 
was a little bit, and she's a friend of mine, so it wasn't ne- really negative, but he was kind of, well, it must be nice to have that, you know, extra paycheck coming in once in a while. And I said, you know, I'm riding here at the airport while you're sitting playing Angry Birds. And so I <laughs> I think that um, stick to it, right? Get your nose out of the cell phone, look up, look at the characters around you, and just keep riding. That's, uh, that's excellent advice. Um, Mark, uh, I love what you're doing. I, I uh, wish you continued success. And is there a new uh, Jericho novel coming out anytime soon? There's a novella coming out in April uh, called Triple Frontier, and then I'm finishing up uh, uh, the next full-length Jericho this month, and I'll be turning that in right before I start uh, another Clancy. Awesome. Awesome. I love that uh, uh, that both of those are coming out uh, uh, in succession. So uh, the new book, again, Tom Clancy, Power and Empire by Mark Cameron. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show, Mark. Hey, thank you, Hank. Good luck. Nick Breaker's book, Essence, book one, Septima, one of the best science fiction writers I know. Nick Breaker weaves some of the best science fiction adventure stories you'll ever read. Essence, book one, Septima, is a must read. Go pick it up today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Third Scribe is the place for authors and readers to meet. Go to thirdscribe.com. You can set up an account for free and you can link up with some of your favorite authors and find out what's going on with them. Authors, you need to have a place where you can highlight your books to your audience. Thirdscribe.com is built especially around books, linking people that love books with people that write books. Go visit them today. Thirdscribe.com. Tell Robin the folks that I sent you. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode 20, just dropped today. It is amazing. With stories by Jess West, Rhett Bruno, Eamon Ambrose, Bob Williams, Tales is my favorite monthly publication. Go pick it up today and get that old pulp goodness feeling. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode number 20, out right now. Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia, 13 stories of animals and humans interacting at the end of the world. Uh, This project also benefits Pets for Vets, one of uh, the most outstanding charities out there, linking up rescue animals with veterans that need some companionship. So go pick up a copy of Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia. It's only 99 cents while it launches. At the end of the show, don't forget we have an audio book clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Behold! The shout broke the Sabbath stillness of the forest. A squirrel paused on the side of an oak, attentive, its tail curling like a question mark. Below its perch, a young man with auburn hair straddled the ruts of the aqueduct trail and raised his arms as if to part the Red Sea. Behold, good people of Sleepy Hollow, I bring you proof, incontrovertible proof, he gestured to the lumpy pile of horseshit at his feet, that the headless horseman doth truly exist. The squirrel shook its head. It turned tail and disappeared into the sway of branches, leaving Jason alone with his work. Jason knelt and fished a trash bag from the back pocket of his jeans. His hands moved quickly, mechanically. He inverted the bag and covered the chunks, trying to gather them all at once, but half went rolling and he had to corral them with a twig. He knotted the bag, jumped to his feet, and pressed his nose to his elbow. Ugh, why does horseshit smell so bad? It started off as grass... How can mere grass go so terribly wrong? He checked his work gloves. Both were clean. Good. He hated to have his hands exposed. His gift had become so damn sensitive ever since Halloween. And what psychic visions might a man get from touching horse shit? Better not to know. He waved the air, gathered his gear, and walked on. He swung the bag of manure as he walked, stopping now and then to spear a fast food wrapper or the shed skin of a drinking straw. Naked branches crossed overhead, stripped of all but the most determined, doomed leaves. Underfoot, 
The October carpet of orange and rust had faded into the browns and squalid yellows of late November. Jason himself was the most colorful thing in the woods. The Department of Sanitation had issued him a bib of fluorescent Gatorade orange, standard uniform for a juvenile offender. The bib read, Community Payback, across the shoulders. The words felt like an open invitation for the townsfolk to pelt him with rotted fruit. He carried a pole for stabbing and a bag for stuffing. He used the pole as a walking stick, mostly, ambling along like an exile in the wilderness. Westchester County had tasted its first sugar spoon of snow that morning, a flurry of dandelion seeds that had bumbled to earth to wink and vanish without taking root, autumn's eviction notice. Jason didn't mind the cold. He'd been raised in Maine, after all, where even in mid-October he might awaken to find the silver Mercedes crackling with frost. From this elevation he could see the entire town. The horn of the Metro North Railroad sounded in the distance. A long, mournful note followed by two short hiccups. Jason stopped to lean on his staff and rotate his sprained ankle. He looked down the hill but couldn't see the broken bridge, Ichabod's Bridge. Too many trees were in the way, too many locust and birch suckling at the sides of the Picantico. He shivered. He'd never gone back to that place. He'd been too afraid. He walked on. A chain-link fence appeared, surrounding a field of headstones. This was the newer area of Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, more modern, more orderly, with room for several hundred souls, though it was only a fragment of the vast graveyard on the other side of the river. A familiar figure appeared among the graves. Joey raised a hand in greeting. Nice outfit, he called. Who says straight boys can't dress? Ha ha, Jason yelled. Get in before dark. He waved and walked on.